Hey guys, this is Mr. Mahmood and you're watching video 4 of the microorganisms unit. Uh, so far in this unit we've talked about viruses and went through some specific details about them and how they're different from cells and their unique properties. Uh, we've gone into the first and second lines of defense discussing pretty much what your body does against everything the same way, what we consider our non-specific immune response to protect yourself. And then we got into the third line of defense or the specific immune response and talks about all the different types of cells that work in uh, together to make sure that you can A, identify exactly the threat that's being brought to you and B, figure out exactly how to attack that cell or that virus or whatever that pathogen might be so that you can control it, keep it from getting too overpopulated and getting things back to normal. Now that third line of defense, like I've talked about before, is your last line. If your body cannot control a population of, of something that's disease causing or pathogenic with that third line of defense then as long as you're not bringing in anything else like uh, modern medicine or anything like that your body can't do it and you will die so it is very serious when we start talking about how that third line of defense works and anything that might compromise that third line of defense so this whole PowerPoint is about specific discussion of things that can compromise what your third line of defense does and that's scary that's saying that that one last line that your body has may not function because of some of the things that we're going to talk about here. So this, this, whole, this whole discussion uh, is very much more serious than, uh, than some of the stuff that we've been talking about before. Hopefully you have a good understanding of the third line of defense already. If, uh, if you don't, it may be a good idea to go back and review some of those parts, but we're going to go ahead and review them together here. Uh, the third line of defense, remember, is what we consider the specific immune response. The cells involved, remember, are the macrophage that is basically a phagocyte as part of your second line of defense. It's your security guard, right? It goes around looking for anything out of the ordinary. Um, and it, if it finds something, it brings it in. So it's a macrophage, it's a large eater, right? So it brings it in, breaks it apart. But instead of completely dissolving all parts, it keeps those receptor proteins, those keys of that pathogen, and puts it out on its own surface, right? So now that that macrophage has a pathogen, it puts the receptors out on its surface, a chemical message is sent to bring in the next cell, and this is the one we consider like the general of the immune response, this is the helper T cell. The helper T cell has its own unique receptors, and every helper T cell is different, so you have a whole lot of helper T cells that come to the site of the infection. Each one, one by one, tries to match up its receptors to the ones that are on the macrophage that were originally on the pathogen. So it's basically like, um, someone that has a huge key ring with a hundred keys on it and they're just going to go one by one trying to put, test each key out into a lock until they finally find the one that matches. So it's basically how helper T cells work. They come in, they have all different shaped receptors on their own looking for a match with whatever's on the macrophage. Once they find the match, that means that they know the exact shape of antibody that needs to be made and then consequently the exact shape of killer T cell that can attack that exact antibody. So once the helper T cell figures out the exact shape needed, it sends a chemical message for two things to happen. One, for the plasma B cell specific to making the antibody needed, we'll start making that antibody. So once you know the specific shape needed, it'll send out a message for the specific plasma B cell that can make that antibody to make it. Right? And usually we're talking about just one, one B cell in your entire body. You have millions of B cells in your body. So just one in particular, or maybe just a couple, are specifically made to make the antibody needed against that pathogen. So once the helper T cell sends the message for that B cell, usually that B cell is going to replicate a lot first, so that one will turn into thousands, or depending on the infection, even more. And then each one of those will start making thousands to hundreds of thousands of antibodies, so that your body has a whole lot of those antibodies ready to go to the site of the infection. If it's a viral infection, it'll tag, it'll basically uh, stick its antibodies to the surface of the, of the virus. So by doing that, it blocks the virus from entering into any more cells. So really, in a viral infection, the antibody production is almost all you need to do to control the virus. Uh, and then if it's bacterial, you definitely depend more on the killer T cells because all the antibodies are doing are tagging the bacteria as the ones that your body needs to kill. So all it does is tag it so that your killer T cells, when they go to the site of the infection, those cells in particular are only looking for that type of antibody. They're just as specific. So when they find the antibodies that have uh, that are they're tagging the bacteria, they attack it and kill it. Uh, it is important in a viral infection as well because the antibodies uh, that have hooked onto viruses that may have been able to sneak into a cell 
will again help the killer T cell know that that cell has been invaded. So anywhere that killer T cell sees that antibody, it kills. So it will attack viruses and stuff outside of the cell. Really, there's no point in it because those viruses have been blocked, so they can't go anywhere anyway. But the killer T cells do break them down. And then they also look for either the bacterial cell or viral cell or any pathogen that has that antibody inside of an, one of your own cells because now your own cell has been compromised. And to keep that cell from being a factory of more pathogens, it just kills the cells that are infected. So the killer T cells go in and destroy anything that's connected or anywhere near that antibody. And that should control your population of the pathogen. And then things can get kind of settled down. And at that point, most of the memory, oh, sorry, most of the plasma B cells that have been replicated will die off. Some of them will stick around as B memory cells. So that in the future, your body can find the same pathogen. And without having to go through this multi step attack, those memory cells can immediately recognize the problem, immediately start producing antibodies to control the population early instead of having to let your body go through all of the process of killing it off. And remember, as your body is fighting off these infections, it's doing things to make you feel bad because it's not just about making you feel bad, it's about making the pathogen feel bad. It's going to change the, uh, the, the temperature in your body. It gives you a fever. It's going to change the pressure and, and uh, space that's needed for the infection. So things are going to swell, causing you to feel pain and achy. Uh, if it's a flu or a cold, it's going to try to block anything else from coming in through the first and second lines of defense. So that's where you're talking about the, uh, the causing your mucus to fill up and giving you a stuffy or a runny nose. All of that stuff are symptoms of your body trying to keep the pathogen from getting worse and definitely to keep anything else from coming in. So that all happens here while you're fighting off the infection. So you feel sick until you make those memory B cells. Once you make those memory B cells, um, you know, everything's been calmed down at that point because your body's slowed down. And in the future, if you get the same infection, those memory B cells will control the infection. You don't have to go through the whole sickness again. It'll immediately control it so your body doesn't even know anything was wrong. So that's your basic third line of defense. And then once everything gets controlled, suppressor T cells are sent out to bring everything back to normal. Because again, your body is pretty much committing all of its energy to the infection. That's why you feel so weak and tired when you're really sick. And the best thing to really do is just give yourself plenty of time to rest. Try not to get involved in activities because you're exerting energy that's needed for the fight against the infection. So you just kind of lie down, let your body do what it needs to do. So things need to be brought back to normal. You can't keep up that kind of a fight forever. You're using up way too much energy. So suppressor T cells bring it back to normal. So that's a very basic review of the third line of defense, basically everything we talked about before. So looking at these cells and talking about um, maybe the importance of them, if there was one cell in particular, one cell that you would think of as the most important part of this third line of defense, the one cell that's responsible for figuring out the exact threat and then sending the message for the cells that are capable of controlling it to actually get to work. What would that one cell be? The one cell that you think would be the, like the general, the most important part and coordinator of the immune system. Yeah, it's that helper T cell, right? So we think of the helper T cell as sort of the general and the coordinator uh, within the immune response. And what do you think would happen if you took away that coordinator of the immune response, if that helper T cell that was responsible for figuring out the threat, sending out the message for the B cells to make the right antibody, and then the killer T cells to come and attack anything with that antibody, if you took away that killer T cell, that means the macrophage knows there's a threat, but the B cells and the T cells, the killer T cells, have absolutely no idea they need to get to work. Without that, we have some very, very serious problems. So you saw this a little bit in the intro. You might have picked up on it as you were watching, but HIV is a very scary, scary, scary infection. And it's scary because of the types of cells that it attacks. Okay? By itself, the virus is pretty much like the flu, pretty much like a lot of other categories of viruses called retroviruses that we'll get into. But it's the type of cells that viruses can attack that makes it so dangerous. Uh, as you know, a virus is very specific to what it can enter into. It can't just enter any host cell. It has its own receptor proteins on the outside that are like keys, and only if a receptor protein is a perfect match for a cell will the cell be tricked into letting it in. 
So a flu virus, for example, works on your throat cells, and there are certain cells in your throat that the flu is very good at getting into, which is not good. It sucks for your throat, right? But ultimately, your body can fight it off. The serious risk here comes in HIV and what it can actually get into. So you got this from the video, hopefully from the beginning, but what type of cells does HIV really attack? Imagine the worst possible cell of your immune response to get attacked. The one that's responsible for all the coordination. It's the helper T cell. So that's why it's so scary. So we're going to get into HIV in a little more detail later. Uh, but there is a little more of a basic discussion that we're going to have about immune deficiencies and, uh, and immune disorders and immune system diseases. So HIV is just one of those that we'll get into. But there are, are larger categories. So just the intro HIV is very scary and you understand it's because of the cells they attack. If you start taking away and killing your helper T cells, you're in serious trouble for a specific response. Alright, so before we get into HIV, let's talk about some of the other categories of immune system disorders. Uh, allergies we have discussed briefly with the second line of defense. Remember, your second line of defense is responsible for recognizing anything that, it's a th that your body recognizes as a threat and then sending out the non-specific immune response against it, which is a release of histamine out into the area or some chemical like that, and then the phagocytes coming to the site of the infection to try to fight it off. And in the process, it produces symptoms that you feel like redness, swelling, uh, heat, fever, things like that, to, to make it uncomfortable for the pathogen and make it easier for your cells to get where they need to go. Uh, allergies are that same inflammatory response, but against something that's non-pathogenic. So it's not something that truly causes any sort of a threat. It's something that your body is just really sensitive to. Your body can sens be sensitive to all kinds of different things, pollen, uh, types of molds, uh, pet dander, things that are in, in foods, in your diet. So uh, there are multiple reasons why your body could be overly sensitive to something, whereas uh, someone next to you may be in the same field with the same amount of pollen and have absolutely no side effects whatsoever. Um, there are genetic factors that go into this, so your DNA and your parents, uh, parents passing on information could have made you slightly more sensitive to certain things. It also has a lot to do with your, your upbringing. If you were highly exposed to something as a child, you could be very likely to be really sensitive to it. Uh, on the opposite side, if you were completely unexposed to something as a child, um, then when, you, when you're exposed to it for the first time, it could be something that your body sees as a threat. So pretty much the two extremes growing up can help you develop an allergy to something, or it could just be genetic factors. So there are multiple reasons why you have allergies for what you do, but the bottom line is what an allergy is. It's your body's inflammatory response, but it's attacking something that poses no threat. And it's actually the attack of it that gives you all of your symptoms. So attacking the non-threat actually becomes a threat because you could have a serious allergic reaction that could cause serious problems with the rest of your body. So an allergy is something that you definitely want to take care of. And remember we talked about taking medications before. Uh, certain medications, like over-the-counter medications, things to fight headaches and colds and flus and body aches and things like that are actually weakening your immune system because all of those symptoms are meant to make it easier for your body to fight the infection. So if you take those medications, you're weakening your immune response, which means it's actually now harder for you to fight off the infection. You usually won't fight it off as quickly and it takes you longer to get over it even though you feel better in the process. That's for medications that are weakening your immune response when you're really needing a strong immune defense to fight something. An allergy is not like that. Remember, the 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 pathogen that your body's fighting isn't really a pathogen. There is no threat there, and the threat is just in your body's attack against it. So with an allergy, you definitely should take something to help your body calm down its attack because there is no need for it, and it's actually a threat to your body because of the severity of the attack. So that's why you take antihistamines, which suppresses the histamine release and makes your body more comfortable. Um, in the process of exposure to whatever that pathogen might be. That's why you take things like Benadryl and then the, the more severe allergy medicines like the Claritins and Zyrtex and things like that. All right, so that's an allergy. It's considered an immune system disorder because your immune system is improperly attacking something. It doesn't need to attack these things, but your body thinks it's a threat and attacks it. So that's one category of immune system disorder. Uh, the other categories of immune system disorders are called autoimmune diseases. An autoimmune disease is uh, when your immune system is fighting your own healthy cells. So 
So this time, instead of seeing something coming in as a threat, some diseases and disorders actually make your immune system recognize some of your own cells as a threat. So when your immune system starts to recognize your own cells as a threat, it starts attacking your own healthy cells. That's called an autoimmune disease because auto is self, right? So an autoimmune disease is when your immune system starts attacking itself. Not because there's any sort of a, a virus or pathogen inside and it's a threat, but it's a perfectly healthy cell. Your immune system just doesn't recognize it like that. So depending on the type of your own healthy cell that it attacks, that talks about the different types of immune system disorders. Uh, the one you see on the left represents multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a nerve disease where your immune system attacks certain cells in your nervous system. So uh, the picture on there is a nerve cell or a neuron. The key thing to focus in on are those myelin sheaths that are right there along the middle uh, of that nerve cell. That middle extension is called an axon and basically it's how the electrical impulse goes from one nerve cell to the next. That myelin, those myelin sheaths surround the axon to keep it insulated so that when the electrical impulse goes through it doesn't just spread out and dissipate everywhere. It stays in one focal point because it's being surrounded by that myelin sheath to keep the nervous impulse from bouncing off anywhere. So it keeps it coordinated and keeps an impulse going from one nerve to the next, which makes it more likely for your whole body to be able to control electrical impulses and coordinate what's going on. Your, um, your myelin sheath can be attacked by this autoimmune disease with multiple sclerosis, your immune system recognizes those cells, those parts of the nerve cells as a threat and actually start breaking away and destroying the myelin sheath. So it takes away that insulation, which means when an impulse passes through, it can pretty much scatter anywhere and it's not as coordinated. So there's a lot less coordination with, uh, with someone who has multiple sclerosis and it can become very serious then because a lot, a lot less information is making it to the brain and making it back to the parts of the body that need it. And there's multiple problems that come from that. Uh, the one in the middle shows you somebody testing their blood sugar, uh, which gives you the representation of diabetes. Now, um, diabetes, we'll get into in the next unit, is a basic problem with controlling the amount of blood sugar um, that you have, the sugar in your blood. Um, there are two categories of how this happens. One is what we consider the one you get from birth, which is the autoimmune disease, where your immune system actually starts attacking, attacking the cells in your pancreas that make the insulin that helps control the amount of blood sugar. So when your immune system naturally attacks those insulin cells and they have no threat to you at all, that's an autoimmune disease. That's what we consider type 1 diabetes. That's when you're born with it and your immune system is improperly attacking those cells. Uh, type 2 diabetes is something you develop over the course of your lifetime because of a very, very high sugar diet when you eat very poorly um, and your body is constantly trying to control the amount of blood sugar, it just is being overworked and basically starts to break down. So it loses its control of sugar in your blood. That's what we consider type 2 diabetes. That is not an autoimmune disease. That's just your body getting tired of trying to control the amount of sugar that you keep shoving down your mouth over the course of your life. So eating a high sugar diet can definitely lead to type 2 diabetes. Uh, but again, it doesn't lead your immune cells to starting attacking healthy cells. It just means you're you're out of you're being overworked. So it's completely different. But the type one diabetes is when your immune cells attack those cells in your pancreas uh, that are responsible for making insulin. And because of that, you can't control the amount of sugar in your blood. That's type one diabetes. The final one that you see on the bottom right there is called rheumatoid arthritis. It's where your cartilage, which uh, is the basic cushion that's between your joints is being attacked by your immune cells. So when your, your immune cells is feeding off and breaking away at that cartilage, that cartilage doesn't grow back very quickly. So as you take it away, it's likely that you're going to have that cartilage missing for a while. So when those cells are getting attacked constantly throughout your lifetime, that means you're losing the cushion between all of your joints. And when bone starts touching bone, and actually grinding against it itself instead of having that cushion, you can only imagine the kind of pain that comes with that. And we're not just talking about in, in a hand or in one part of your body, but that happens throughout your entire body. So all of the joints in your body have much less cushioning and support, which can be extremely painful. So rheumatoid arthritis is another example of an autoimmune disease. So all of these diseases are where your immune system attacks your own healthy cells. Okay, That's called an autoimmune disease. All right? uh, there are different types of immunodeficiency diseases, which is next. Now, in this case, autoimmune disease, your immune system attacks its own healthy cells, right? We've talked about that. An immunodeficiency is where it's actually your immune system cells 
that are getting attacked. And as I mentioned with HIV, this counts, this, this falls into the category of an immunodeficiency. A deficiency means you, you don't have enough of it, you're losing it. So an immunodeficiency means you're running out of your immune cells. So that happens when your immune cells are actually the ones getting attacked by something. So there are different categories of immunodeficiency diseases. There, there are those that are genetic, that we consider hereditary, that's not HIV or AIDS or any of that. Uh, there are specific categories of immunodeficiencies that are hereditary. Uh, one is called severe combined immunodeficiency disorder. Um, uh, that disorder is basically when your immune cells aren't being produced properly. So from birth, you're not making enough immune cells, which means you become highly susceptible to infection because you don't have the cells needed to fight against it. So people like that, depending on the level of uh, uh, severe combined immune disorder, you could have situations of kids in a bubble, right? Have you, you might have heard of the bubble boy and, and things like that, where they have to live in an environment that is so quarantined and, and so protected because just the slightest pathogen, anything that you and I can fight off with no problem, they, they could have a serious reaction to because they don't have the immune cells for it. And there are medications that you can take uh, from birth that will slowly build up the immune cells that your body isn't naturally making on their own so that people with this kind of severe combined immune disorder can eventually live a pretty healthy life. So we've advanced pretty well in technology and helping people with the hereditary categories of immunodeficiencies. However, the acquired immunodeficiencies are a completely different story because those cells are getting attacked by a virus or by a pathogen that can become um, very, very dangerous very quickly. So the acquired side is the one we're going to talk about when we get into HIV. All right, so the acquired side here, again, focuses in on the specific cell that your body really has the hardest time doing without. The one cell in your immune system that would completely crumble your immune system is the helper T cell. And unfortunately for us, HIV has the perfect receptors that match up to every single helper T cell in your body. I told you guys how, how uh, helper T cells have multiple different receptors all throughout the body and, and one helper T cell comes in at a time and matches up until eventually the right one matches. That is true, but also within every helper T cell, they all have very specific helper, uh, sorry, very specific proteins. So they have some variety of proteins and that's varieties where they're able to match up, but all of them have consistent ones. And one of the ones that every single helper T cell has unfortunately for us is the one that HIV has managed to match perfectly to. And we'll get into the detail on that and I mentioned that in the video as well. So the helper T cells were actually getting attacked and killed by HIV, which is why this becomes an immunodeficiency because it actually kills the, those helper T cells in your body over time. And once you lose those helper T cells, you have no specific response. The B cell and the, T, the killer T cell that are in your body that know exactly how to fight an infection, never even know they have to get to work. They just sit in your lymphatic system while your body just gets completely invaded by the pathogen that they can protect because they never got the message from the helper T cell that they needed to get to work. So without the helper T cell, even if you have the cells to protect yourself, they don't do anything and it serves you absolutely no purpose. So this is why it gets really dangerous really fast. So those are your helper T cells. Once the helper T cells get destroyed, then you are in serious trouble because you lose your specific immune response. So let's talk about HIV. Can you guess what HIV stands for? Hey, right. So immunodeficiency, remember, is when your immune cells are getting attacked. So the virus that attacks the immune cells of a human is called the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. So HIV tells you the category of virus that it is. It's an immunodeficiency. Some specifics within HIV that we're going to get into. One thing it's important to understand that HIV is what we consider a retrovirus. Retrovirus, uh, the word retro, if you ever dress like, have like a retro party or anything like that, it means you dress like you're back in the 80s or back in the 70s, something like that. So retro means back or reverse or backward, right? So a retrovirus does things in reverse. And the thing that it does in reverse in particular has to do with its genetic information. Most cells, uh, all cells, I mean, and most viruses have genetic information in the form of DNA. And as we're going to talk about more in the spring, for a cell to function properly, the DNA has to make proteins. And to make proteins, it takes a little copy of itself that goes out of the nucleus to, to put the protein together. And that copy of itself is called RNA. 
So the RNA is a, usually a copy that's made from the DNA, and that RNA is usually a temporary copy. If something ha happens to it, if it's damaged, it's usually no problem. As long as you have the DNA, you can keep making more copies from. That's usually how cells work. The DNA has the information. You make little copies of the DNA in the form of RNA to go and make your protein. Retroviruses actually don't start with DNA. They start with RNA, which you think is something that would be a problem for it. But in reality, this process of going from RNA to DNA from a much smaller set of genetic information to making it much bigger has a much higher chance of mutation and changes and corrections and errors. And it's actually the, all those corrections and mutations that result in that virus changing a lot over time. So it's actually what's protected it from us. We've been able to control certain viruses like chicken pox and smallpox and things like that because they're not retroviruses. They have DNAs, their genetic information, and they stay for a long time just the same. They don't change very much. But the ones that are retroviruses that have RNA, every time they get into a cell, they have to go from RNA, which is much smaller, to a much larger chain of DNA. And that comes with a lot of error and a lot of change. And every time it gets into the cell, it has the chance to change itself just a little bit. And that's what's making it so much harder for us to fight off. So we'll get more into that. But it is RNA as its genetic information. It has an enzyme inside of the capsid that's called reverse transcriptase. The process of going from DNA to RNA is called transcription. So the opposite is called reverse transcription. And then the enzyme responsible for reverse transcription is called reverse transcriptase. They didn't make it hard on you, right? So that enzyme is very important because it's the one that'll help the RNA of HIV turn into DNA. And the same thing's true for the flu. The flu is also a retrovirus. It goes in that same reverse direction, and it needs that reverse transcriptase to help it, right? Uh, and then another key thing that I want you to remember on the outside, the specific protein, the receptor proteins or the keys that HIV has, is called glycoprotein 120. So GP120 is the specific name of the shape of protein that the virus has in HIV that will allow it to match up to helper T cells. It happens to be the perfect match for every single helper T cell in your body. So now that you understand the basic components, let's talk a little more about what happens here. So HIV replication is, is a lot like the lytic cycle, and specifically it's the lysogenic cycle that we've talked about before. So you're going to see a lot of similarities here. Um, the, the five steps of the lytic cycle are pretty much represented here, uh, and then there's a little bit more within HIV that we'll talk about for each one. So let's walk through the process. Step one, just like any virus, is attachment. In order for a virus to be able to uh, match and get into a cell, it has to first put its receptors and match up to the receptors on the host cell. So viral attachment is what we consider step one. The receptor proteins on the outside of the cell match up to the receptor proteins on the surface of the host. Now in this case, the GP120 is the name of the receptor proteins for HIV. They match up perfectly to a particular category of receptor proteins on every single one of the helper T cells. There are actually two of them, and I mentioned it in the video. One of them are called CD4, and that's why a lot of times helper T cells are also known as CD4 cells because of the type of uh, receptors that all, all of them have. So CD4 is the first receptor that that GP120 binds to. And then as it binds to it, it'll then bind to a second set of proteins, receptor proteins that are on the helper T cell as well. Those are called uh, chemokine receptors or CCR5. If you ever hear CCR5, that's the, the other receptor that the uh, GP120 is able to match up to. So the GP120 of HIV matches up to the CD4 and the CCR5 of the helper T cell. That's step one. That's what we consider viral attachment. Once that virus gets attached, now we talk about the next step. It won't be able to enter its genetic information into the cell unless it can match up perfectly to that cell, just like any other virus. So step one is viral attachment. So now step two is entry, just like we talked about in the lytic cycle, the release of the genetic information inside. So in this case, the capsid gets broken apart it kind of dissolves like you saw in the video and the genetic information as well as that enzyme the reverse transcriptase is being allowed to enter into the cell so along with the reverse transcriptase there are a few other enzymes that we'll talk about later that are brought in with it so the the virus has the information it needs and has the little help it needs to get things moving but it definitely needs a host cell to take care of everything for it 
So it has everything it needs and it gets it into the cell because it's able to attach itself from the GP120 of the virus to the CCR5 and the CD4 on the surface of the helper T cell. So now we have the genetic information inside of the cell. The viral information from HIV is now inside of the cell. Now remember, it's what we consider a retrovirus. Retro, again, means that the genetic information is in the form of RNA, and it's actually going to have to work backwards in order to get the DNA to match up. So the cell inside, uh, inside of a helper T cell, just like any cell in your body, is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA has two strands. It's much longer, much more complex than RNA. So in order for the genetic information of a retrovirus to actually be able to mix in with that of the host, it can't just try to put a little thing of RNA, which is just single-stranded and very small. It can't try to match up RNA with DNA. It won't happen. The only way that the viral information can match up with and mix in with the genetic information that's already there is if it's in the same form. So instead of RNA, it has to convert to DNA. And that process, like I mentioned before, going from something very small and very simple to something really complex, that takes that usually has a lot of error. You guys, it's a good example. If I um, asked you to copy 10 pages of a book and just go to a copy machine and make copies of it, there's a good chance that most of it will be 100% accurate. But if I told you, okay, take the first page of the book and then make the rest of the 10 pages, then there's a good chance that what you make isn't going to be exactly what was there. So to go from something small and make it bigger and make it more complex usually has a much higher chance of error and change. So this part, this part right here, the fact that it's what we consider a retrovirus makes HIV, makes the flu, makes the common cold, makes those viruses things that can change frequently which is a big problem for us because if you remember our memory B cells are there to recognize the exact same threat in the future and if it does recognize it it makes the antibodies and blocks it right away but if it changes just a little then that memory B cell doesn't recognize it which means your body has no choice but to go through the whole process again so that's why you keep getting a cold and keep getting a flu multiple times throughout your life and that's why HIV another reason why HIV is such a severe threat not only because it attacks your helper T cells but it changes frequently so when you start talking about trying to find cures against it and treatment for it it's very difficult because it's a retrovirus and changing so uh, before it can actually mix in with the cell of the host once the genetic information gets into the cell, the RNA has to turn into DNA. And that process is called reverse transcription because it's the opposite of what normally happens. Normally your DNA is there, and when it makes proteins, it makes a copy of itself. So DNA normally goes to RNA, which is usually very simple and usually with very little change because you're taking something big and making just a copy of a small part of it. But this, uh, this is the opposite. So retrovirus goes through reverse transcription. So now it's put itself in the form of DNA. So now the genetic information in the cell that's in the virus matches to that in the, in the actual helper T cell's nucleus. So it's the same category of, of genetic information. That DNA is also in the form of DNA. So now after step two and after the fact that the retrovirus is able to occur and that reverse transcription is able to happen, now we have the genetic information matched up and will mix in with the host cell. That's called integration. That's a key part that we're going to talk about here in a minute. But integration to integrate is to put things together. So once the DNA has been made from the retrovirus, from the reverse transcription, it's going to integrate itself into the host cell. And it's usually at this point where the cell will sit still. You guys remember we talked about lysogenic viruses? After it uh, enters into genetic information and matches it up to the cell, it'll usually, in a lysogenic phase, stay there for a long time. And that means your cells have no idea there's anything wrong. They function normally. And from the outside looking in, all of those phagocytes in, the, in your immune cells, the macrophages that are there to protect you, they don't see any kind of a threat. So those cells are able to function normally and everything's fine uh, until it's actually jumping into the next stage, which is replication. So HIV works the same way. And it has a long period where it'll sit and do absolutely nothing, which means from the outside in, those cells are completely normal. And then little by little, they'll start jumping into this replication phase. So now, instead of making proteins for the cell, the viral information is going to take over, shut down the rest of the cell's DNA, and then start making more and more of the virus. So now it's going to start making all the little parts of the virus, all the proteins that are going to eventually be parts of the virus. You saw in the video how those parts are little by little being brought up to the surface of the cell. And as those parts are being made, 
They'll get brought up to the surface for the eventual combination of those parts, which is the viral assembly we've talked about before. And then that viral assembly, little by little, will result in the um, eventual formation of the virus of another HIV and that HIV is then allowed to release. Now here's uh, the big difference between HIV and other viruses. We've talked about the, the uh, other viruses like the flu. It causes the cell to burst and when a cell bursts that's why it dies because there are too many viruses building up inside. HIV has kind of moved beyond that. It doesn't cause a cell to burst right away. For a long time it'll make just enough more HIV to keep spreading itself, but it won't cause the actual destruction of the cell. It'll keep using that helper T cell to be more and more of a viral factory while uh, the cell itself doesn't, doesn't become destroyed. And that means your immune system doesn't really recognize it as a threat uh, as much. So the virus is actually not popping the cell, causing the cell to burst. Instead, little by little, as new viruses are forming, they break off. Eventually, the virus will become so strong and powerful and it'll eventually take over the entire cell that it will cause so many cells that it'll cause the helper T cell to burst. But there's a period of time where there are just enough viruses being made that are keeping the cell from bursting and keeping your immune system from recognizing much of a threat. It might just occasionally be able to recognize that the viruses are there, but it's not enough to really start the full attack against it. So that's what we call the release, the fifth step, similar to the release of the lytic cycle. But the cell doesn't necessarily have to burst. The helper T cell doesn't necessarily have to burst. In this case, it can actually just be used over and over for a while without actually destroying the cell. But there usually does come a point where uh, there will be some kind of a trigger and researchers are still figuring out what that trigger is that will get a lot of the helper T cells that have been invaded by viruses to quickly turn into the full-on lytic cycle and they'll all burst very quickly and release millions and millions of new viruses into the area which, which is where your body really starts going downhill because it goes from having a, a relatively high helper T cell count to dropping down to almost nothing. At that point your body becomes highly susceptible. And it, that's when you were talking about really, really dangerous stuff. So that's the fifth step where we consider the release of the virus, whether it happens slowly in the earlier stages or when it is a full on lytic cycle at the end, the bursting of the cell causes the release of all these new HIV into the area that can all attack new helper T cells. All right, so now let's talk about the difference between HIV and AIDS. Uh, let me ask you this question. How many people in the world since HIV was identified, I think back in the 1950s or so, how many people have actually died of HIV? Take a guess. You're probably wrong. No offense. But the answer is zero. Nobody has ever died of HIV. Think about that. What have they died of? Yeah, they, they, HIV, all HIV is doing is attacking their helper T cells. The helper T cells drop down to almost nothing. So the helper T cells dropping makes you very susceptible, it makes it very likely that you're going to develop a kind, some kind of an infection. But it doesn't actually kill you. It's not what kills you. It's just dropping your defense, right? It's eliminating your specific immune response. But it is not what directly kills you. What directly kills you then, if you have HIV in, in the long term, is an infection that your body would not be able to defend against. It normally would be able to, but it can't anymore. So when you're talking about uh, your helper T cell count dropping down to a really, really low level, then you become susceptible to other types of infections that can kill you. So people that do die that are HIV positive don't die directly of the HIV, but they die of an infection they got because HIV drop their helper T cell count. So when you get to the point where your helper T cell count is so significantly low that you become at a serious risk of developing these kinds of infections, that's when you're diagnosed with AIDS. Okay, AIDS is not a separate disease. It's simply a diagnosis. Okay, when your helper T cells counts drop below 200 helper T cells per microliter of blood, a microliter is a very small amount of measurement of blood. When your helper T cells count drop below 200, then you're diagnosed with acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Right? It's acquired. We talked about the four, the two categories. It's an immunodeficiency, and we call it this acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Once it's actually caused your helper T cell count to get into the 200 or lower 
helper T cell count area. It's at that point that you are in some serious, serious trouble because your helper T cells are so low that now you have very little that you can do against an infection if it can get past your first or second lines of defense. Once it's past the first and second lines, you don't have the commander there to tell the right B cell and the right killer T cells to get to work. So they won't get to work, and instead that infection can just build up and become very, very dangerous. So normally your helper T cell count, as you can see here, is in the 12 to 1500 range per microliter of blood. That's a healthy individual. So at, over the course of developing HIV, you can go for years without actually having a drop like that because you can be in that period where the helper T cells aren't being destroyed right away and the HIV is just little by little making new ones where which means you don't feel many symptoms of it your body doesn't attack it and you stay pretty healthy so you can go for a long time feeling pretty normal as far as you know because HIV is in that lysogenic phase and if it does switch over then it's very uh, very minimal and then out of, out of nowhere all of a sudden it can get triggered and all of your helper T cell count can drop. Your helper T cells can die off quickly because now they are bursting and you see a huge drop in your helper T cells and at that point you become susceptible to an infection. So it's when your helper T cells drop below 200 microliters per, or sorry, 200 per microliter of blood that you're considered to be diagnosed with AIDS. So when you have AIDS, now you're talking about uh, a very high risk of developing infection which could be very dangerous for your, for your life, right? So you can be HIV positive and not have AIDS. Most people who are HIV positive stay HIV positive for quite a while until they develop acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Now once you're at that point, that's where you're really susceptible to these infections. These infections are what we call opportunistic infections. An opportunistic infection, again by definition, is something that would not normally cause a spread or cause any sort of a serious threat to someone with a healthy immune system. But if something's immune system has been weakened, then these infections can become much more serious and can become life-threatening. So these are the things that people with AIDS and with HIV tend to die of. These are the infections that can build up in them that wouldn't normally build up anywhere else. Now, an opportunistic infection can technically develop right around in about 500 uh, helper T cells per microliter of blood. So remember, we said before, you had to, uh, you're not diagnosed with AIDS until you have 200 or less. So could somebody die of an opportunistic infection before they develop AIDS? I mean, do the math, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you're anywhere in the range of about 200 microliters to 500 per microliter, anywhere in that 200 to 500 range, you don't technically have AIDS yet, you haven't been diagnosed with AIDS, but you can develop these kinds of opportunistic infections. So absolutely, people who are HIV positive can die before they're actually diagnosed with AIDS. So that's, that's, that's a true statement. So uh, these are examples of them. Um, you can, there are pictures of each of these and things like that, but most of these, again, are types of either uh, infections, types of fungal growth. One of them is a type of cancer, a skin cancer that develops, Kaposi's sarcoma is a skin cancer, a fungal growth. All these different things and types of pneumonia, all, all those different things are things that your body would normally be able to control if you were healthy. But because you're losing your helper T cells, you can no longer control it. So people who die uh, that are HIV positive or that are diagnosed with AIDS don't actually die of the virus. Don't actually die of HIV, they don't die of AIDS. They die because their immune system's been weakened so much that they develop these opportunistic infections. So people who are HIV positive or have AIDS die of opportunistic infections, not of the virus itself. All right, so you, you know, we talk about detection of HIV. This is a serious issue because the reality is you can have HIV or you can be HIV positive and have absolutely no symptoms. And we've talked about the reasons for that. You develop, um, your, your helper T cells are being invaded, but they're not being destroyed. So your immune system doesn't see a threat for a long time, which means you feel completely normal, very healthy, even though you actually do have helper T cells invaded by HIV, you are HIV positive. So uh, tests can be done for that, but it takes a little while from the point of uh, uh, infection, where it actually is contracted, to uh, develop enough uh, HIV in your bloodstream and around your helper T cells to actually be something that could be detected in a test. So there is a period, what we consider a window period, where not only do you not show any symptoms, but you can actually get an HIV test 
and it can come up negative even though HIV is in your body. It just hasn't had the chance to really build yet because it's in that lysogenic phase and it very rarely pulls out any new HIV. Uh, it's a very slow process. So there's a period and it depends uh, on the individual but it can be up to about eight weeks, up to six months where you are HIV positive but if you go get tested you don't show any symptoms of it. So let's say you involve yourself in some sort of an activity that makes you more likely of developing HIV or a good chance that HIV could have been passed on. We'll talk about what those are. If you're worried about it and you want to go get tested, there's a good chance that that test may not even show up positive, even if you are HIV positive, if you go right away. So there's a window and there's a period. If you feel like you've involved yourself in any sort of an activity that puts you at risk, there's a period where even though you don't show positive for it, it's in your body, it's in your bloodstream, and you can listen carefully, you can pass it on. So if you pass it on to someone else, obviously you didn't know you had HIV, uh, but now they have it as well. So you have to be very careful here uh, in this time frame. If you did it, do anything that put you at any kind of risk, obviously you'd have to be careful about the actions that you take from that point on. So this is what we consider the window period where even if you're positive, you may not show a positive on a test. It takes a little while to develop enough HIV in there for your immune system to start any kind of an attack against it. And the, the HIV test actually looks for the antibodies against HIV. So they look for the, the, um, the few antibodies that you can make before you start killing off your helper T cells. Uh, and that's how you show a positive for the blood. Um, so it takes a little while for that, uh, that amount of antibodies to build up. So that's that, what we consider the window period. Then within that time, once you do become um, diagnosed and HIV positive and the test does come up positive, you can still be asymptomatic. You can still have no symptoms. You can still feel perfectly fine for quite a while, depending on your health and also the types of medications you can take. Uh, there are there are medications out there that, um, that scientists have identified to help prolong what we consider this asymptomatic phase, to make it longer for your immune system uh, or longer for your body to, to function normally until your immune system really starts getting destroyed. Uh, and depending on the types of medications, this can last for a while. Like Magic Johnson, for example, I think he's been HIV positive for upwards of 15, 20 years, uh, and he still shows very little to no symptoms because he's taking all of these medications. Problem is all the medications are very expensive, and not everyone in the world has the luxury of being able to afford these things. But if you have the luxury and you have the means, then you can survive a, a pretty long time as HIV positive and still have absolutely no symptoms from it. It's once it actually jumps into that lytic cycle and really starts bursting all of your helper T cells and your helper T cell counts to drop that you really start feeling symptoms because of it because now your immune cells weakened and other infections can start to develop from it. So that's when it becomes symptomatic and that's where uh, the opportunistic diseases can really start becoming a threat. Uh, and then finally the last stage within this infection is when the helper T cell count has dropped so low that you're now at 200 helper T cells per microliter of blood or lower and you are diagnosed with AIDS. And again, it doesn't have to be after you're diagnosed with AIDS that you would actually develop the opportunistic infection. You really become at risk for it right around that point. But usually at that point, unfortunately, people who are HIV positive do hit that roadblock uh, where they will eventually be introduced to an opportunistic infection that their body cannot control and unfortunately they will die because of it. There is no cure for HIV. It's important you understand that there is absolutely no cure for HIV. There are treatments against it. So let's talk about some of those treatments are um, just very quickly. There are a few examples of things that you can do within this cycle to try to make it harder for the virus to function. The first category of medications are what we consider fusion inhibitors or um, entry inhibitors. Those are medications that are specific to stopping and blocking step one. So making it hard for the GP120 to match up to those CD4 and CCR5, if you can make it difficult for them to attach, then it's less likely for the virus to be able to get in. So it's not as successful and it slows down that rate of replication for the virus. So one step is to try to block it from getting into a new host cell and there are specific medications designated for that. So if you take those then it's less likely for the viruses to get in or they're less successful at it which gives you a longer chance and longer time to enjoy that asymptomatic phase. Uh, the second category of viruses uh, are the ones that are considered sort of the miracle drugs. Those are the ones, if you ever hear of like a miracle drug for HIV that's happened in the last 10 years or so, uh, it's these categories. Uh, they're called um, NNRTIs, 
but a nuclear non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors is the scientific form for it but they're really just called reverse transcriptase inhibitors so an inhibitor is something to slow something down or to weaken it uh, and in this case it weakens the reverse transcription process by making it less likely and for the reverse transcription to happen in that reverse transcriptase that the uh, virus has and brings with it if you use a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, then it makes it less likely for that virus to turn its RNA into DNA. And if you can't turn RNA into DNA, you can't mix it into the host, and you never take over the cell. So that's a big one that this, that's been described as the wonder drug for HIV uh, treatment, because it makes it much harder for the RNA to turn into DNA, which means it makes it much harder for the cell to get invaded by genetic information from the virus. So you have fusion inhibitors to try to keep it from coming in. You have reverse transcriptase inhibitors to try to keep it from turning from RNA to DNA. You also have integrase inhibitors. Integrase is an enzyme that helps the integration of the new DNA into the host DNA. Uh, so if you have other enzymes there to try to block the DNA that's been made from the RNA to actually get into the cell's DNA, that's another area of blocking the integrase inhibitors. And you also have protease inhibitors that are in the assembly process when everything's being put together in step four. Protease inhibitors uh, enzyme the, uh, or, um, inhibit the actual production of an enzyme that helps finalize the virus at the very end. So you have these four steps of medications. You have fusion inhibitors, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, and then finally protease inhibitors. All of those are attacking the different parts of this cycle and making it much, much harder for HIV to successfully make its way through. So if you have the means, all of these are very expensive, you take these medications consistently, daily, uh, for the rest of your life, you, much, you have a much better chance of surviving a long time in that asymptomatic phase where you can be pretty healthy. Right. All right, so finally, let's talk about the categories of how HIV is transmitted. Uh, there's more we can talk about with this, but this is the area that gets into um, kind of a touchy subject, and we don't want to discuss things that may be uncomfortable for you or for your family. So we're going to be very specific and very quick when we talk about this. Basically, HIV transmission occurs through bodily fluids that do not include saliva and other parts uh, that are produced um, through your, through your mucus or anything like that. So you, let's make some things clear. You cannot transmit HIV through kissing somebody, through uh, sneezing on somebody, through drinking after somebody. Those do not contain the virus. The virus is actually in the bloodborne plasma of, uh, of an infected individual. So only bodily fluids that actually contain some sort of a plasma can actually be passing HIV. That does not include anything in your facial region. So that's one uh, one thing that we can clear up now that's not correct. But it can be transmitted through blood or through other bodily fluids that contain that plasma. All right? So any sort of contaminated blood can pass it on. I think before 1986, um, doctors didn't test the blood from people who were donating. So anybody who might have been HIV positive before could have donated blood. And then if you were in some sort of a car accident, something like that, and you needed a blood transfusion, you could have contracted blood that was HIV positive. So blood carries HIV, so through any sort of a contaminated blood there. Since 1986, I should tell you, uh, they do clear screening, very strict screening for HIV. So um, anybody who, who gets a blood transfusion should not have any sort of a risk related to HIV. It's, it's uh, 0.0001%, something like that. Because there is that window period that we've talked about before, but blood is usually stored for a long enough time to where they can test it multiple times to make sure that it's never HIV positive before it's given to somebody. All right, so that's contaminated blood is one category. Uh, sharing IV needles, because IV needles, if you use the same needle more than once, it carries with it a lot of the plasma and the fluid from the individual. So if they are HIV positive, it can be transmitted that way. So hypodermic needles, usually through drug use, um, are the ones that can transmit and transfer uh, HIV. You can also talk about mother to child. Now here, we have to be very careful here. HIV is not genetic, right? A mother who has HIV, if she's HIV positive, she doesn't give any sort of a genetic information to her child to develop HIV. The transfer of the disease comes in the transfer of fluids and pathogens. So blood actually doesn't transfer over between mother and child as the child's developing in the womb, but it's actually right at the very end 
when the actual um, during labor and things like that where blood can be tr transferred over to the baby and if HIV in that blood is able to make it to the child then it's possible the child could become HIV positive. It's not a guarantee. If the mother's HIV positive there's no guarantee that the child will be HIV positive uh, but there is a very high risk involved in that because the blood does transfer over right at the very end right during labor and that's one way again blood transfer could cause it. And then finally we'll just say any sort of unprotected sexual contact of any kind revolving and um, using any sort of bodily fluids from uh, from any of the intercourse process. So we'll leave it at that. I don't want to go into any kind of detail, but any kind of unprotected sexual contact, and I don't even want to say unprotected, even protected has a risk. So we'll leave it there. There is a risk for developing and transferring HIV uh, if you're positive, even if you're not showing any symptoms and you're absolutely normal, you take a test and you show HIV negative, you could still have the virus inside. Um, it just hasn't had a chance to really build up yet. Alright guys, thanks a lot. You've watched all four videos. You should be ready for the test. Take care.